Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, great to see you all. I, I don't know whether it's a sign of the times, but I'm wondering why nobody's sitting up close to the podium today. This is, do I, do I feel a little unloved here or something? Is, you know, what's going on here? Well, uh, welcome, 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 everybody. And to those online, likewise, welcome to you. I see that we have a guest, Shelley Taylor. She's a guest of mine. So it's very nice to see that Shelley's here as well. Um, today is the 30th of May. What a beautiful time of the year. I swam at the outdoor pool yesterday, which was fantastic. I watched the final episode of Succession, which was totally amazing. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. No spoilers, no spoilers. Um, but yesterday was Memorial Day. Um, really significant, important day. And I'd like to sort of combine two things in my preliminary remarks here. Um, we, we have an incredible announcement today that Fred Dunn has been a member of this club for 50 years. Isn't that incredible? And in 1973, Fred had just come out of the army uh, and was based in Germany and everything happening in the 70s and including the Czechoslovakian invasion and various things happening in, in Berlin. Uh, and Fred, I wanted to thank Fred, and I'm gonna invite everybody in a moment as well to, to thank you so much for your service, but also to this club. Uh, this club, Service Above Self, is, is so central to everything that we do in this club. And it's amazing and wonderful that Fred has been part of the club for this long. I should also mention that Fred's grandfather, also by the name of Fred, but Fred Seward Dud was a uh, charter member of the Bloomington Rotary Club in 1918. Isn't that amazing? So Fred, thank you. Um, and with that, I'd like to invite any other members of our club who have been in the military or in government service in that way to please stand and be recognized. Um, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your service. And yesterday was a day in which we recognized those who have made the ultimate sacrifice to supporting our country um, and the democracy that we live in. So thank you so much. With that, I would like to invite everybody to stand and we can uh, recite the Pledge of Allegiance with me. So please join me. We pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. With liberty, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, thank you very much. That's something that um, I've always been very inspired by through the years that I have been an American citizen. Great, and I'm gonna invite Sarah Laughlin to come and join me here at the podium as well. And she's gonna do our reflection for the day. Thank you, Alan. I wanted to talk about literacy today. You may not remember how you learned to read. For me, it was just one day I could. And I remember my son who in the first grade saying to me one night when I was tucking him into his top bunk, mom, I'm, fine. I'm glad I finally found something that's more fun than Nintendo, age six. Um, and I said, what is it, Isaac? He said, reading. But a lot has to come together before you learn to read. And as I learned in my professional career, and I've been noticing these necessary pieces in our Afghan refugees, Jawahir and Rahim, because as they become literate in English, and for Jawahir, literate, period. Um, so the first one is print motivation. And that might be um, easy to understand for you. It's the pleasure of reading and, and understanding text. I wanna give a huge shout, shout out to Sandy Keller who spends about 20 minutes a day when Jawahir is working for her, reading with her. This is Jawahir's favorite part of her job. So reading motivation is for sure there for her. Print motivation. Print awareness is understanding that text carries meaning and having the book right side up. That's how they test it in kindergarten, pre-kindergarten testing is they, they give a book to a child and they upside down and they see if he turns it over. Well, um, obviously, for, for people that, that speak, per, that learned Persian or never did, um, the, uh, 
the, uh, the problem is they read, read from right to left um, and there's no shared alphabet at all, completely a different alphabet. So starting from scratch there, but they don't have any trouble with understanding which side of the book is up. So print awareness, we can check that one off. Letter knowledge. Okay, this is about recognizing the letters and being able to sound them out. Well, a couple of months ago, Raheem pulled out a three by five card that he carries in his pocket. And it has the capital letters and small letters in English and the Persian equivalent. And he, was, he said, I've got this, the capital letters um, under control, but the small letters were giving him fits. So think about the B and the D. Think about the G and the Q. Um, and I remember my kids struggling with that and occasionally getting them backwards as they were learning to write. So that's a good clue for me about where he is. Um, and then one day recently, we were downtown parking on the square, on the east side of the square, across from Caveat Emptor. And as we got out of the car, I heard Rahim going, cup, cup, cup. And he's looking up at the sign on the top of that building. And you may remember that it's a giant KP for the Knights of Pythias. That's the Knights of Pythias Hall. So to try to explain to him what that is, <laughs> and yes, it's phonetically cup, but that's not the word, that's not how you spell the word cup. So there are a few things that are uh, letter knowledge that is, you know, befuddling to someone learning from another language. Then the, th the fourth one is vocabulary, of course, and they say that children can understand 10,000 words before they can say one. And um, I think I've heard Rahim and Jawahir say a few words. Rahim, uh, Jawahir said to me one time, are you hungry? Um, and she is very particularly passionate about learning the names of fruits and vegetables and colors, which is what she knows and what she cares about. Um, and Rahim now says, how are you when, when he's greeting me? But when I say, I am fine, how are you? He can't yet answer. Um, but I know they're listening hard to my conversations with Amina and Shams and to other people. And then there's phonological awareness. And this is understanding that words are made up of letters and, and groups of letters. And this is probably the hardest part especially in English where it's not always regular. So for example, uh, Shams was the other day saying chord. He looked it up, he, he did his phone translation. He looked up, he said chord. I said, oh, that's chord. It should be chord, but it's not. So there are a few things like that that get in the way, but it, Persian is worse, they tell me, because in Persian, there are no vowels. You just interpolate from what's there. And that's why I think we have Amina, but we have Amna Navaz on, the, on PBS. Same, same name, just at that little vowel not inserted. Um, narrative skills is the last one. And this, as you can imagine, is the art of storytelling. Or, uh, so it's being able to tell a story or to give, a set of, to give directions you know, with, a, with a set of steps. And I think for most kids, this doesn't kick in until the first grade. Um, so we aren't quite there yet, um, but I'm looking forward to the day when I hear them tell a story with, you know, multiple, multiple steps in it. So helping them has been its own reward, especially for me, uh, tying together my own joy of reading and with seeing the pre-literacy skills developing in this family who is so thirsty for education. Um, it gives me a new appreciation too for Rotary's dedication dedication to literacy around the world and reaffirms what an IU professor said to me once when we were talking about literacy around the world. He said, literacy is always liberating. Thank you, Sarah. That's absolutely wonderful. As always, um, so great to have you here with us and everything that you do. Okay, so, um, few announcements here. We've got a birthday to celebrate, Marcus Debro, uh, May 30th today. So happy birthday, Marcus. Uh, member anniversaries in, in, included in Fred Dunn, included uh, with Fred Dunn are a, a number of people actually. So we'll start off with 17 years for Joy Harder. Congratulations. 
we've got uh, we've got Sally Gaskell at twenty four, uh, Judy Lucas twenty six, uh, Mike Hoff thirty, Bob Zelsberg. I didn't know if you knew this, but it's thirty five years. Congratulations! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, Marshall Ghost uh, thirty six, Winston Shindell, uh forty one. Woo! Fantastic. Tim Thrasher, 42, and then Fred Dunn coming with 50. So congratulations to you all. I don't know, I don't know what it was, but last week we had none. And this week we have this bumper crop. So that's really pretty amazing. Oh my God, Judy Schroeder. I don't have you down here. This is incredible. 35 years. Well, congratulations, Judy. Thank you. I will I will check into that because there must be some reason why. I, did I mention it last week? Ready? Oh. Oh, there it is. Judy Schroeder. <laughs> Sorry. My, my, my apologies. Judy, Judy, you are one of the most important people to me in Rotary. So that has nothing to do with, uh, there's no, no Freudian stuff here whatsoever. Okay, uh, we have guests in the club today, I believe as well. Tracy, do you wanna come and join me here? And while we're on, let's introduce our guest online, first of all. Um, Kyla, do you wanna do that? Thank you, Alan. Uh, we have two guests with us today. We have Shelly Taylor, guest of Alan, and Michael Glab, guest of Michelle Cohen. Welcome guests. And here in the house, we have Robert Wolford, who is the son-in-law of Wendell. Welcome, stand up, please. <laughs> and then our future member that was just approved, Forrest Gilmore. Yay! I'm gonna ask Tracy to stay with me because we have a very special ceremony. We have a new member of our club and I'm gonna invite um, Tracy to come up and do it. All right, we are on a roll with that international theme here. We've got our second Kenyan coming on up. Wilson, join us. So Wilson Shatandi moved to Bloomington, Indiana early this year. Before moving to Bloomington, he served as the Director of Postgraduate Studies and Senior Lecturer and Founding Associate Dean of the School of Music and Media at Cabarrack University. Currently, he works as an adjunct professor in the school, Jacobs School of Music. In addition, he's pursuing an online course in learning and cognition. Shatandi is a music, music educator, an ethnomusicologist, easy to say, an active choral conductor, composer, arranger, and is a strong advocate of community-based music making as a vehicle for social change in Kenya. Besides his passion for music education, Wilson has used his musical gifts to impact lives of the less privileged in the communities in Kenya. He's used mu music to offer a platform for people to commune, fellowship and dialogue as means of addressing their day-to-day -day challenges. Presently, Wilson serves as the Kenyan representative in the Kenya Scholars and Studies Association under the leadership of last week's inductee, uh, Dr. Gerano Rotich, the current sitting president and associate dean in school public health at IU. In Bloomington community, Shatandi is already involved in helping with settling the refugees as a Kishwali interpreter with Exodus, and he is also a member of Voces Nave Ensemble under the artistic directorship of Dr. Sue Swaney. So, Aaron, if you would be so gracious as to do the induction. Wilson Shatandi, on behalf of the board and membership of the Bloomington Rotary Club, it is a great pleasure to welcome you as the newest member of our club. We look forward to the fellowship that we share as well as your participation in the club projects that make our club, community, country, and world a better place. Though Rotary isn't a political organization, Rotarians are vitally concerned with good citizenship and the election of effective leaders to public office. While Rotary isn't a religious organization, it is built on those highest principles that have served as a moral compass for people throughout the ages. Rotary is an organization of business, professional, and community leaders pledged to uphold the highest ethical and moral standards. Rotarians believe that worldwide fellowship and peace
can be achieved when people work together and uphold the Rotary model of service above self. Rotary activities exemplify the partnership, respect, and generosity that one would expect from people who believe they have a responsibility to help others. Wilson, you have been chosen for membership in the Bloomington Club because your fellow members believe you to be a leader in our community and because you possess the qualities to champion the message and principles of Rotary. You are a representative of your vocation and talents within our club and community. You have now become an ambassador of Bloomington Rotary, carrying the ideals of service to all within your sphere of influence. Our community will know and judge Rotary by your character and service. We will also look to you for inspiration as we strive to become better Rotarians. We will now pin you with the distinguished badge of a Rotarian, your Rotary pin. We ask that you wear your Rotary pin with pride, not only to all Rotary functions, but in your many endeavors as a symbol of your commitment to Rotary ideals and our recognition of your contribution towards a better world. Fellow Rotarians, please rise if you are able and welcome our newest Rotarian, Wilson Chitandi. And now for some pictures. Look, fantastic. Congratulations, Wilson. Um, another one from the Southern Hemisphere. Amazing. Absolutely fantastic. So um, also, want, you know, Forrest Gilmore was just congratulated as well because he's going to become a member of our club, which is so fantastic as well. Let's give him a round of applause. He has just been named by the city of Bloomington as the human, with the Human Rights Award of the Year. Congratulations. Yeah. And you will remember that Sandy Keller, our the good member, was also the Human Rights Award winner last year. So there must be something about becoming Rotarian or something. I don't know what it is. Okay, well, a few quick announcements here. A few quick announcements. Well, maybe it's Michael Shermus on the inside of the city. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, a, there's an announcement actually from Michael Shermus to remind everybody on the program committee that they're meeting immediately after today's meeting. So please stay for that. Um, we're going to show you the, the Bloomington Rotary Foundation slate for 23-24. Um, so with, uh, without further ado, let's have a look to see all the names. We have Trent Deckard. Um, Trent Deckard, a huge uh, thanks to Trent, who's going to step up to the plate for two years running. Thank you, Trent. Lauren Snart, immediate past president. Thank you so much, Lauren, for everything that you've done this year um, for the foundation. Teresa Clare, new member, treasurer. Sally Gaskell, myself, Jim Capshu, Evan Brewington, Liz Feidel, Amy Osajima, Jim Shea, and Natalie Blaise as our ex official member of the, of the um, committee. So congratulations to all. This is really great. Um, I wanted to also mention that um, Lauren, you know, he's been unbelievable past president, one of the real movers and shakers of this club. He really wants to focus this next year on the Fountain of Youth project which will enable us to get to the point where we can endow the scholarships that we provide to high school students and uh, Abbey Tech students and so forth. So thank you so much, Lauren, for everything that you do. Um, living room conversations, I sent you some information about that last Friday. Uh, we've got a few people who've stepped up um, as leaders of a few of those conversations. Myself, I'm gonna do one of them. Charlotte Zietlow, thank you, Charlotte, so much for doing that. 
as well as Joy Harder. And I'm hoping that I've not left anybody out. I need to go through my email to make sure that I've not left anybody else out. But we will be sending you further instructions and ideas of how to be able to connect up with these conversations. Uh, it's a fabulous project, and I really look forward to seeing it happening blossom during the summer um, um, here in Bloomington. Uh, Sally Gaskell, as you know, has been um, with uh, Lance Everly and a number of others from this district in Australia for the international convention. And she's been posting in the most beautiful ways um, uh, about what it's been like to be there. There was, a, there was a, a post that she gave, I think it was just this morning, talking about how she's been so deeply moved by peace, justice, um, the, the, the way that Rotary really, really impacts the world um, in, in so many different places. And she's having an absolutely fabulous time there. Um, so hopefully she'll be able to give us some of her thoughts when she gets back here. But I, yeah, what, what is that? She, she mentioned that. So it was 56 degrees with a sheep grazier warning. Does anybody know what that means? There's been a big, it's like become a bit of a meme on, on Facebook. Nobody knows what it is. Maybe somebody could sing a, uh, create a song about that or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to also mention, you know, I forgot to mention last week that the, um, the Habitat for Humanity House in um, honor of Charlotte Zietlow was completed and there was a fabulous celebration. And I don't know if I'm going over this again, so forgive me if I am, because I don't believe that I mentioned it last week. But Charlotte was there. A whole lot of other people were there um, mm -hmm. celebrating a house that uh, is now uh, the home of Laura and her two kids, Zoe and Eric, um, supported by the toast that we did two years ago for, um, in honor of Charlotte. And um, altogether, just an absolutely amazing day. So congratulations to Charlotte, Charlotte and thank you. A sheep, okay, a sheep grazer warning tells sheep farmers that wet, windy, and cold weather is on its way. And, and something else, there's something else to it as well. But that's, that's what it is. Okay, so um, Judy, thank you very much for greeting today. Um, Tracy, once again, for everything that you do in this club. Kyla, on, online handling the Zoom uh, session for, um, for us. Sarah Laughlin, for your reflection. Bob, as always, thank you so much for being the reporter for the month. Um, and, uh, and then Tyler, so much for uh, handling our technology. So let's invite Michelle Cohen, one of our uh, club members to, well, Michael Shermis is gonna in introduce Michelle Cohen to talk about um, Monroe County and water, so. Thanks a lot. Okay, so uh, a couple of years back, I had the honor of helping Lake Monroe Waterfront folks with their mission statement. Um, it always makes me feel particularly grateful to be involved with an organization that is something I really cared about before I ever even heard of them. And having clean water is uh, near and dear to most community members uh, and Rotary members that I know. Uh, with that, it's an honor to bring our very own Rotary member, Michelle Cohen, to speak to us today about clean water. Michelle serves as the executive director of the Lake Monroe Water Fund. She has 12 years of experience heading uh, other environmental entities, including the Brown County Solid Waste Management District and the Indiana Recycling Coalition, now dubbed Circular Indiana. Um, a Buckeye turned Hoosier, she grew up in Northeast uh, Ohio and moved to Bloomington after graduating from Wittenberg University in Springfield, Ohio. In 1996, she earned a Master's of Science in Environmental Sciences um, degree from the O'Neill School for Public Environmental Affairs at Indiana University. And Michelle uh, has lived in the Bloomington area for over 25 years and enjoys spending time with her husband and two teenage sons. Michelle. I'm gonna put my water over here. I've got allergies, so hopefully I'll be able to get through this just fine. I almost I'll sit right there. Um, so uh, Alon, I know why people didn't sit in the front. They didn't wanna block me because, you know, <laughs> I'm not short, I'm under tall like Garfield. <laughs> <laughs> I know I start with a bad joke. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and as Michael mentioned, um, I've been here for quite some time for about 25 years. Uh, but my newfound uh, love for water has kind of come back. Uh, since I was a kid, I've loved water. I was the only one in my family who really did. Nobody else wanted to go swimming. I was always the kid who was like, please, let's go. And so my mom called me a water baby. And the rest of my family was like, eh, we're tired of that. My sister wouldn't get her face wet in the pool, you know, yeah. Um, so growing up in Ohio, you know, of course we have Lake Erie, but I wasn't really near that. Um, 
So one thing that I uh, did when I selected my college, you wouldn't think that Wittenberg in Springfield, Ohio would have much of a water uh, connection, but they have a marine biology program. Strangely, <laughs> you can go away for um, a summer and you can spend some time uh, in San Salvador in the Bahamas. So see if this goes. Oh, there's my title screen. I'm going to bypass that real quick. So I was fortunate enough um, to be able to do that. So um, my first love for water is the ocean. Uh, that's where it kind of started. So I spent a summer doing wonderful snorkeling and and we really learned a lot, but it was an a, amazing experience and a massive amount of fun. Um, so that's kind of where I start this. So as you know, we've got so much water on the globe, right? Um, but I want to talk a little bit about, and most of you probably already know this, I'm sorry if I'm preaching to the choir, but um, salt water versus fresh water. So 70% of the earth is covered by water. If you were to take that and roll it up into a ball, you've got right there, that would be 860 miles in diameter. So very small compared to the size of the globe. Now you take that and you think, okay, well, 97% um, of that water is salt water. So what's our fresh water look like? And if you roll that into a ball, you've got that size, which is about 170 miles across. So we start thinking about, okay, what, what can humans use? What do we need to survive? Going further, you probably can't even see it. The smallest water ball right there, right about where Atlanta would sit, is only 35 miles across in diameter. And that is surface water upon which most of human life and wildlife depends. So we really do have to protect a very precious resource on the earth. Um, one thing I was thinking about when preparing for this was the uh, Rotary International focus areas. And my job really aligns with two of those very well, providing clean water, sanitation, and hygiene, and protecting the environment. So as I was thinking about this, um, this last one brought up kind of a, a, not a pet peeve, but it's just something I like to think about. We always say, the environment as if it's something out there far away from us and i always like to frame it as our environment because we are breathing the air we are drinking the water and that kind of brings it home for people you know if you say the environment it sounds like oh well that's something way out there i don't need to worry about it but it really impacts everyone's human health every day so you may ask yourself what the heck's a water fund I haven't heard that before. The idea behind a water fund was sparked by the Nature Conservancy, which I'm sure all of you have heard of. <laughs> huge, huge um, environmental organization. And about 20, 25 years ago um, in Quito, Ecuador, they started the first water fund. And the idea is to get resources, financial resources, technical assistance, from downstream users and invest that back into upstream interventions and um, practices that can help protect water quality. So that's the idea. You want to have folks who are benefiting from the resource investing and protecting it upstream. So throughout the world, um, the Nature Conservancy has sparked or started many water funds. This slide is a little bit old. I think we're at more like 43 water funds created um, across the globe. And one of the, oh, I'm gonna go back real quick. Um, so our water fund is the first one in Indiana. So we're, we're um, the Nature Conservancy of Indiana thought, you know, where, where in Indiana would um, a water fund make sense and would it be successful? And so with this community's um, commitment to the environment, I did it again, to our environment, <laughs> um, they felt like this was a, a good place to do it. So we were fortunate enough last year to um, 
be the recipient organization of a, a capstone class at SPIA of their one week intensive study. So um, they were looking at different water funds across the globe and seeing how um, we fit in. And they noticed a pattern is that the majority of the water funds were started either as reactive or preemptive um, water funds. And for example, the Rio Grande River Fund began after a huge fire in 2011. I'm gonna to flip to my notes here and get the stats right. So in that case, it was a, a you know, destructive event that really got people's attention because the fire that burned was the largest in New Mexico's history. Now it ranks the fourth, and that was just in 2011. So you can think about how rapidly we're, we're getting a lot of those Western fires happening. It burned 160,000 acres in June. And in August, torrential rains swept down bare slopes and just inundated everything. And so the water utility had to shut off intake for over two months. So that gets people's attention, right? So that's when they created the Rio Grande River Fund. Preemptive is when you've got something that might happen and people look and go, oh, this might become an issue. So this water fund, the Brandywine Christina Healthy Water Fund is in Delaware, but it was created because a steel mill was gonna be built upstream in Pennsylvania. So a water fund is something that can go across political boundaries, right? Because if you have like a government entity dealing with it, you don't kind of have that um, ability to act within the natural boundaries of a system um, like you would with a nonprofit water fund. And then proactive, and that's where we fall. So there is one other proactive water fund in the United States in Portland, Maine, the Sebago Clean Waters um, Fund. And they also have a um, drinking water source and it's heavily forested around it. So we're similar to them. So as Michael was saying, um, back in about 2017, there was an exploratory group saying, hey, do we wanna do this? You know, What do we think? And then, COVID hit, <laughs> which I know they kept, you know, they kept meeting um, virtually, but then we actually got incorporated in 2021. So as an organization, um, the idea has been around for a while. It's been um, talked about, and then we actually formed a couple years ago. So whoops. this is just a screenshot of our website it's at the top it's pretty easy to remember lake waterfund.org and this is the statement michael was talking about so what we want to do is to be a, a funder for watershed products product projects to conserve um, and sustain lake monroe for our entire community for drinking water and for recreation and for the economic benefits it brings So most of you probably know this, but just thinking about what, what do you mean by a watershed? Sometimes people hear that word and they're like, it's a shed in my backyard. I've got my hose in it. I've got my garden supplies. No, that's not it. Uh, it's just the area of land that precipitation sheds or runs off of into whatever body of water you're talking about. So you can think of it like a big irregular shaped bowl if you want. And then you know, the bottom of it is the river or lake you're talking about. Sometimes people call it a drainage basin, which seems to resonate a little bit more than watershed. Um, if you've heard the phrase watershed moment, I was thinking about that and I was like, where does that come from? And so I looked it up and it's kind of that dividing line. If you're talking about a watershed moment, it's that dividing line in um, you know, culture or history at which point there's a change in direction. So if you think of a watershed, there's a high point at which the water falls and there's a change in direction. So that's kind of something I like to think about too. So Lake Monroe, if you, if you don't know, is a reservoir and it's the largest inland lake in Indiana. It's almost 11,000 acres and it's two thirds of the size of Bloomington if you want some context. Yeah. 
It was built in the 60s by the Army Corps of Engineers for flood control. And then the city began using it as a drinking water source in 1967. So right now it, it varies depending on how, if the students are in town or not, but you can figure 130 to 150,000 people rely on it um, for its drinking water. And the average intake is 15 million gallons per day. So we've had a history for those of you who are new to the area of Bloomington relying on surface drinking water supplies that then become too small to be used. So we had University Lake, then Griffey, then Lake Lemon, now Lake Monroe. So we wanna make sure that we keep this for as long as possible. And also a lot of you um, are aware that it's a really great uh, resource for wildlife. There was bald eagle reintroduction that was very successful there. It's one of those things that kind of gives you a sense of place and without it, you know, what would the Bloomington area be? I think it, it really has created a, a wonderful sense of place around here and mental health benefits. And there's a lot of photographers and things like that. So beyond just what you might think of as the importance of the lake, those things are also interesting to think about. So I'm gonna show you a map of the watershed. Um, interestingly, Bloomington does not really sit in the watershed. So there's Bloomington. There's like a teeny weeny little sliver that is in the watershed. So even though we benefit from it, we do not, you know, anything that goes down in the storm sewers here isn't part of what's happening, you know, upstream. So Brown County is the largest portion of the watershed, about 56%. Monroe and Jackson both have 21%. And then there's teeny little slivers in Lawrence and Bartholomew. And for those of you who were here for um, Christian Freitag's presentation about Sentinel Landscape, Camp Atterbury is right there. And part of the watershed is in Atterbury. So that's something I'm interested in trying to um, use that designation to help us with grant funding and things like that. That, that Sentinel Landscape designation has to do with military installations trying to preserve their activities and make sure that they have um, buffers um, against development encroaching on um, what they're trying to do. I think he said something about, you know, wildlife doesn't complain <laughs> to, with loud, loud uh, activities. Um, so that's, that's our watershed. And I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. Um, there's the Atterbury. So there's Martinsville, there's Bedford. Here we are, there's the lake. As you can see, we've got a lot of forested areas. Um, those in green are just the government owned forest areas, but a great portion of this is over 80% of our watershed is forested, which is a fortunate thing. And this shows, you know, we, we're kind of the, the nesting uh, quality of watershed. So our watershed is there and we go and it flows into the White River and it flows into the Wabash then eventually goes into the Ohio. So this shows that area that I'm talking about. It goes into the Mississippi, which of course then flows down to the Gulf of Mexico. So anybody know what that is? It's called a dead zone. So it's the scientific term, it's hypoxic. So it has lost its oxygen in the water. So that means that fish, uh, other critters, cannot survive in it. Um, and they either move out further, so fishermen have to go out further to get their catch, or if they can't move fast enough, they die. Um, it happens every year. There's a whole task force across the Midwest to try to mitigate it. But that's something that we are trying to um, make people aware of. And you know what causes that is nutrients. Nutrients sounds good, right? <laughs> so whatever we put on the land to grow things, right? Fertilizer um, or manure. Uh, so it can be synthetic fertilizer or manure, or it could be, uh, unfortunately, this is the gross part. I hope you all aren't grossed out by stuff. <laughs> it's errant septic waste. So if you have sewage, that's gonna promote uh, plant growth. Um, so anything that we want to grow, great on land, but if you over apply, it gets washed down and it promotes algal growth in water which then you get this um, system where all of the oxygen gets depleted to 
the algae dies, it decomposes and kind of makes everything unlivable, unlivable for other species. So that was depressing, I'm sorry. <laughs> back, to, uh, back to us. Um, I mentioned we were proactively formed, right? So that can be a blessing and a curse, right? We've got something to protect and it's in pretty good shape, which means, hey, that's good. Protecting it is going to be um, less costly than you know, trying to fix something once it's, got, uh, once it's been damaged, once there's a crisis, but we also have human nature. Human nature is pretty much like, well, nothing's really wrong. I don't need to do anything, right? You know, we see that in our own health, right? <laughs> you know, it's like prevention is, is not as um, motivating as a crisis. So those two things are kind of in balance. Um, one thing that we have experienced here is in the summertime, we have gotten algal blooms in the lake. And they're not at a level that has made the drinking water toxic at all or um, you know, unsafe to drink but it's got the yucky taste. I can see faces. <laughs> They're like, oh yeah, I remember that. Uh, so that has kind of gotten in people's minds. It's like, oh, well, maybe we do have something we need to think about because that can get worse. So we wanna prevent that. Um, just so you know that the safety of the water is fine. Uh, the utilities test their water every hour. So we've got a, a very good, um, drinking water utility here, I feel like, and all of their data is on their website. You can go find it, you can look at it yourself. It's very transparent. Um, so with that, we're thinking about how do we get people to um, take action to protect the water quality? And so we, we started building some momentum this past year. Um, as I mentioned, we started a couple of years ago. The first year was really kind of the getting started to be able to hire staff. So they had a, a board of directors or have a board of directors, um, 12 folks who hail from around the watershed and have different, wear different hats, uh, public sector, private sector, um, folks from the city, things like that. And one of the things we've been doing is building relationships and making sure we're out in the community and talking to people. And I feel like that's gonna be the strongest thing. You know, We obviously are a fund, we want to, raise money so that we can do good works. But I think the relationships come first, you know, and then that will follow. Um, what we have done uh, so far, as far as funding, it has been a lot of uh, grant seeking this past year. And so we've got some projects going that I'll talk about um, in the next slide. So we selected three different areas that we wanted to work on. Um, one was what can we do in uh, forests, woodlands, wetlands, streams, those kind of areas. The second was what can we do in the septic system improvement arena? And the third is what can we do to reduce fertilizer runoff like in you know, agriculture and pastures and lawns, gardens, et cetera. One quick thing about um, agriculture, we you know, don't have as much agriculture in our watershed as you would have in northern parts of Indiana, you know, where you go for miles and miles and miles and all you see is corn or soybeans. Um, but it does exist here. But then also the way folks treat their lawns and think about what, what's a lawn, right? It's not a natural existing plant system. You, you put it in, it's, you're trying to get one type of plant to grow. So it's a monoculture. And a lot of times people use chemical fertilizers and they use way too much, or they put it on right before it rains or, <laughs> or things like that. So we're trying to educate folks about proper fertilizer usage and minimizing it as well. And lawns are actually the largest irrigated crop in the United States. Corn beats it out if you, if you put in the corn um, unirrigated, but it's, it's a huge amount of land. So the project that we've done so far for um, in the forestry and um, tree planting arena, we were fortunate enough to work with the CYO camp, uh, Rancho Formosa in Brown County. And it sits right next to Claylet Creek, which eventually runs uh, into Salt Creek and eventually, eventually runs into the lake. We planted 
600 willow stakes and 900 native trees and shrubs. And the willow stake planting right here. So their creek, you know, it's got a lot of eroding and bare soil areas. So the idea is you put these, they're just essentially sharpened twigs from willow plants and you stick them in the stream bank and they will grow roots and they will get bigger and they will help hold the soil where it's, where it's gone. And you can put them in like horizontally and they'll, they'll stay. So we did that in um, March and I was really happy with that because I was afraid I was gonna be down there by myself <laughs> putting in the last 100 or something like that because we had to put it off because of rain so much, but we had a really good day, got them in. And the other good thing is we timed it. So fortunately we didn't have a big washout or anything. So they've, they stayed and they're sprouting. So I'm happy about that. Um, and then the second portion of that was planting trees of native varieties and shrubs. And we did that. This line of volunteers is right along the creek. There's one, you know, one kind of line of trees and then you drop down into the creek. Um, but this area here, they use as, you know, a camp, their campers play and, and do things on that area. So we couldn't go too far this direction, but we did get a nice line of trees here. And we've got some um, as well in an area where the water would come off a slope and we're trying to slow down that water. You wanna slow it down, soak it in, spread it out. So you don't get rushing water going into the creek and carrying sediment. And this project was funded by Duke Energy Foundation and Smithville Charitable Trust. So that was a really great um, learning experience. And I think that the other opportunity is all the campers at the, at the camp, there's like 6,000 a year visitors, we're gonna put up, um, or they already did put up some signs. So they're gonna educate the kids as they go through. And they've already got, um, there we go, there's our sign. They've already got bluebird boxes and an owl box and bat boxes and beehives, you know, so they're already on it, you know. Um, but I'm really pleased with that that's going to be an ongoing source of education. How much time do I have left? The second thing we're doing is involving septic systems. And we've got 9,000 septic systems in the watershed, over 9,000. A lot of them are really old. A lot of them may or may not be functioning as they should be. And the soils in our area are not conducive. <laughs> they're not ideal for septic systems. They're, they're not good. <laughs> so, but you know, the problem is it's really costly to deal with, with that. So this program that we um, are doing in Brown County is to help folks to either get their system inspected or their tank pumped. And we're providing $200 reimbursement for that. So if someone is in the watershed and they go to their we're working in partnership with the Soil and Water Conservation District, they go show a receipt from a licensed contractor and we say, okay, well, we'll give you $200 to help defray that cost. So that, that cost um, isn't huge, but it helps, it helps. So this program will help raise awareness. We've got enough um, funding for 50 households and, um, Right now, I think we're at about 10 or so have taken us up on it. So we just got started on it and it's moving right along. Um, and then we're also doing uh, on the fertilizer end of things, a soil testing program through the Monroe County Soil and Water Conservation District. And it's offering a free soil test to folks who live in the watershed when they're gonna do a garden or planting or you know they've got some landscaping problem or they've got you know a hobby farm. So it's not for the big farmers. So um, so much as the, the, you know, I call it a hobby farm. But that just kind of gets people's awareness going and getting them thinking about, well, maybe I should change how I'm doing things, or maybe I don't need to, maybe this thing that I'm trying to plant is not the best thing and I shouldn't use so much fertilizer. I should, I should change plants to something that grows better here. I'm gonna wrap up. Um, I better hurry up. Okay, so future initiatives. A couple of things I want to mention. I'm just going to skip to, I'm not, there we go. Um, this. So the septic system thing, last thing I'll say, and then I'll, I'll finish up, is that we know that the vouchers we're offering is kind of a Band-Aid solution. So we have a grant application into the Department of Environmental Management and it's federal funding. And we've made it through the first steps and we're hoping to get the, the yes, you got it in the fall. And that is to put together uh, a group of folks around the table from the finance sector, 
from health departments, from anybody, and figuring out how can we help create a finance system for grants, for low interest loans, for, for no interest loans, for different levels of income in the state to help people repair or replace their septic systems. So that's a big thing coming up. So if you have any ideas about who should be around that table, please let me know. Um, with that, I think I'm over time. <laughs> but thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'll hang out over here for a little while. Okay, I can stay. Okay, sorry, I was rushing. I can stay for questions. What is the relationship between the, the water fund and the Friends of Lake Monroe? So Friends was one of the groups that I mentioned in 2017 was around the table um, talking about this. So they've been involved um, since then when the water utility was another uh, group involved then. And now we're, we do things, we try to let each other know what we're doing um, so that we're uh, complementing activities. And in the future, what we're hoping to build is to build a fund that can actually help fund some of the work that they want to do. Right now, we're kind of just starting out and, and getting going, but that's kind of the difference. They do a lot of the science and advocacy stuff, and we're really about doing the project. Oh, is there anyone online with a question? I have a question that nobody online does. Um, you talked about protecting Lake Monroe. What about protecting it from political pressures like when Bert Servas introduced legislation to let Indianapolis access Lake Monroe? Yes, so we haven't developed an advocacy platform or advocacy arm yet. That might be something we look at as we go into strategic planning, but that is a good point of looking at policy and, and politics and how that impacts things. So as of right now, we don't have that bent. Constant attempt to to um, keep the wet, wet, wetlands or, or let the wetlands be, be despoiled and including the recent legislation, which makes it fewer and fewer wetlands and that's not a good thing. What do we do? Well, that's leads into that question because that is one of the uh, bigger policy type questions and you're right that wetlands have been the protections that were existing have been rolled back and that is a big problem is that it i guess i missed it earlier but what is your connection with the nature conservancy and what do they contribute so the nature conservancy you know kind of uh, was the impetus for forming the water fund. And we still have a Nature Conservancy member on our board. Um, and they have also given us a grant to help us um, get started and, and actually help us do a micro grant program ourselves. So we aren't really under their organizational umbrella, but they're there for support. And for example, I borrowed, maybe stole, borrowed the, the uh, freshwater you know, slides with, with the uh, blue marble kind of pictures from them. So I can go to them for resources like that. And for, you know, hey, I don't know this answer to this question. Can you help me? So it's good. It's almost like a mentorship in a way. I had a home on Lake Sweetwater and I noticed that's at the edge of the, wa on the watershed. And I noticed about six years ago, they put a mandate in that all septic systems had to be inspected every three years. Mm -hmm. And uh, that I think has really cleaned up all that dense residency around that lake. It seems to me that a good approach would be to seek out other conservancies who can mandate uh, septic tank regulation because you'd hit a lot of septic tank systems that way. Yep. And I think that that might be one of the only actual conservancy units um, in the watershed, but you're right that they have done a lot of work to protect their, their lake as well. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it's amazing service above self. There's some of us who really take that very seriously and make it our entire lives. Um, and Michelle, you are definitely one of those people. And thank you very much for everything that you do 
to make our, our community and, and this uh, physical world such a better place that it can be. So thank you. Um, a few little announcements before the end. Uh, we have our spring celebration happening. Um, I think I mentioned this, but I want to mention it again. Uh, the good news is that we've been able to reduce the uh, ticket price to just $15, which is the same price as a meal uh, here um, on Tuesday. So we hope that all of you will join us on the 13th. I sent you information about that this morning, so I don't need to repeat myself. Um, we've got Gus Shikalis in our mind, in our thoughts right now. Um, I believe that he's going into surgery next week. And so we'll be thinking about him as he goes through that surgery as well. Um, and then uh, for next week, uh, we have uh, Katie Broadfoot, Executive Director of Monroe County United Ministries, who's going to be with us, uh, extraordinary human being. Her talk is entitled Ending Generational Poverty and Interrupting Situational Poverty Models that Will Move Families Towards Self-Sufficiency. So that should be very, very interesting. And with that, I invite you to join me in the four-way test plus one. Um, of the things we think, say, or do, first, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? And fifth, thank you all so much. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.